So we're starting chapter eight today. Chapter eight is the chemistry of corrosive materials. And of the chapters that we have talked about thus far, and probably to the ones that we will talk about in the future, this is probably the one where we have the most common knowledge experience. Because corrosive materials involve all acids, all bases, and all the reactions that those acids and bases entail. And for the most part, it'll involve terms that you are familiar with in some part already. Acid, base, pH, the pH scale, and so on. So from that perspective, you've got a lot of experience with these kinds of materials just in general in what you do every day. But what makes these different and what makes these worth our study is because of their commonality, they also have a number of common chemical reactions, things that you probably were aware of, but not necessarily thought of the chemistry of those kinds of reactions. So let's kind of start at the top here. What is a corrosive material? Well, we can depict corrosive materials using one of these two placards, either the corrosive placard, which is the DOT placard, um, the black and white one with the number eight on it. On that pictogram, we see two different images. There is the image over here of a reaction with metal. And over here, there is the reaction with skin. And these two pictograms are common for all corrosive materials. You can see that the Global Harmonized System placard there on the board with the red outline has the exact same two pictures. And the reason is because by definition, a corrosive material has to react either with metal or with your skin or both. Now, there is only one division in corrosive materials. There are not a whole bunch of subdivisions like we see in you know, other kinds of materials, things like our flammable solids where we've got three or four different divisions and explosives which have seven divisions and um, other things like that. These are relatively simple in terms of their chemical reaction. They do kind of the same things. But we also know that they are the largest class of hazardous materials. More substances, industrially speaking and consumerly speaking, from your home have corrosive capabilities to them, if in the proper concentrations. So while your Windex window solution might have some ammonia in it or some vinegar in it, Chances are pretty good that it is dilute enough that if you spill a whole bunch of it on your skin, it's probably not going to do considerable damage unless you just let it sit there for hours and hours and not actually do anything about it. Whereas household ammonia, stuff that you actually buy to like clean the floors and do some major level cleaning and disinfecting, that stuff is going to burn your nostrils. It is going to have some effect on your body if you treat it in the wrong kind of way. So there is some variability in here that we do have to account for. Some definitions. To qualify as a corrosive substance, it has to be a consumer product that will destroy living tissue such as your skin or your eyes, your mucous membranes in your nose by chemical action. So, these materials will um, react with your skin, with your other external organs, and they will do some kind of damage to those living tissues. That's what it means to be a corrosive substance. And so again, this covers most of your household materials that happen to be corrosive as well. A corrosive material 
for distinction here, a corrosive material is a liquid or a solid that can cause full thickness destruction of the human skin at the site of contact within a period of time. And this also applies to liquids that are capable of reacting chemically with steel or aluminum surfaces. And so again, look at that placard, look at that pictogram. What are the two things that are depicted in that pictogram? There's a reaction with metals and there is a reaction with skin. And both of those reactions are quite robust. They're quite dangerous. So in order to be classified as a class eight corrosive material, it has to cause more than superficial damage. It has to cause considerable damage. Now, <clears throat> to help us identify some of these corrosive substances, what we really need to do is look at acids and bases. Now, under acids and bases, there are a number of different definitions that are used to help us to define acidic products and basic products. Yes, Josh. Of these definitions, we will focus primarily on something called the Arrhenius definition. The reason we're going to use the Arrhenius definition is it is the simplest, is the easiest to kind of figure out and see, and it covers most of the things that we're going to encounter on a common basis. There are other definitions of acids and bases that deal with the movement of hydrogen ions or deal with the movement of electrons. For the most part, they're, they're beyond the scope of this class. Um, these are the kinds of things that we talk about with chem majors and helping them to get a bigger handle on the wide variety of things that react as acids and bases do. The Arrhenius definitions are pretty simple. And one of the beauties of their simplicity is in we can relate them directly to chemical formula. Under this particular definition, Acids are substances that generate hydrogen ions in water. So what that means is that in a chemical formula, we usually see them as hydrogen followed by something else. So things like HCl for hydrochloric acid, HNO3 for nitric acid, H2SO4 for sulfuric acid. Bases are generally substances that are going to generate hydroxides in water. These we can recognize as having something and an OH ending group. Things like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and even ammonium hydroxide, NH4OH. Now, In this particular definition, we have to be careful. Things like alcohol groups um, have OHs at the end of their formulas. And those actually tend to be slightly acidic rather than basic. Again, we're not gonna get into all the reasons why. Um, If it's a carbon-based OH, then it's not basic.
But again, what we're going to look for under this definition are formulas that either start with hydrogen and there are therefore acids or end with hydroxide OH and our bases. That's the simplicity of the Arrhenius definition. It's either one or the other, or it's neither. It can't be both. Now, in terms of their corrosive capabilities, acids have a lot more reactivity than bases do. Acids can react with metals. They can also react with basic um, ionic compounds like metallic oxides or metallic carbonates. Common examples of these are things like magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, or for the carbonates, sodium carbonate. sodium bicarbonate, which you know better as baking soda. And also your skin. Bases on the other hand, don't have some of those middle options. Bases will react with your skin and bases will react with certain types of metals. Now, again, the list of metals that acids are capable of corroding is longer than the list of metals that bases are capable of corroding. Acids just generally are more corrosive and more reactive. Non, uh, excuse me, uh, bases, bases have reactivity, but the extent of those reactions are not nearly as strong. Um, and a large, a large part of it goes to, um, in terms of metals, um, certain properties of the metals that they can react with versus others. But don't get me wrong. If you get base on your skin, it can really leave a nasty mark. The reaction that takes place is not something that we will joke about or mess around with. It is, it is just as corrosive to your skin if it is in a high enough concentration. And because bases come in solid forms as opposed to liquid forms, they're a little bit more difficult to work with in that sense as well. You get a little nugget of lye on your hand and it'll slowly start to work on that skin and it will leave a nice burn mark if you don't actually treat it. All right, let's look a little more closely. We've got some acids here. Again, based on our Arrhenius definition, acids are substances that will produce hydrogen ions in aqueous solution. So that means that when the acid dissolves in water, the H plus ion separates from the rest of the compound. As I mentioned before, the acidic hydrogens, we can always pick them out based upon chemical formula. So once again, we can look at this and see, okay, I've got hydrogen out in front here. I've got hydrogen out in front here. I've got hydrogen out in front here. Hydrogen out in front here. These are all acids under the Arrhenius definition. How do we get these acids? Well, for the most part, their reactions come about by the reaction of oxides 
with water. And in particular, we're looking at non-metallic oxides. So for example, P2O5. P2O5, diphosphorus pentoxide, is a common product from the burning of phosphorus in air. P2O5 and P4O10 are the most common products from the burning of phosphorus. We can find those kinds of things when, like, when we light matches. Uh, there's a small amount of red phosphorus on those that burns. We get um, phosphorus oxide compounds that come out as a result of that. When those phosphorus oxide compounds hit water, they will transform into the acid, phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid known for a number of purposes, but if any of you drink colas, whether they be Coke, Pepsi, or otherwise, pretty much any brown soda, there is probably phosphoric acid in it somewhere as a stabilizer. Uh, not phosphoric acid, but usually there's citric acid and some other things. Um, um, if you take the pH of sodas, most of them will come out on the acidic side. Um, part of that has to do with the carbonic acid, just because carbonation itself is an acidic producing process, but usually there are other agents in there either as chemical flavorants or as stabilizers um, to help keep all the other ingredients together and keep it homogenous. Yeah, yeah, and it's a lot of money too. All right, so that's acids. We can quantify acid strength on one factor and one factor only. And that is the stronger the acid is, the more H plus ions it's gonna put into that water. So it's not a matter of concentration, it's a matter of strength. How good is that molecule at breaking apart inside of the water? Some do it very, very well. We call those strong acids. Strong acids include things like hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid. Other key strong acids that you may have heard of, HNO3, which is nitric acid. And of the strong, strong acids, those are probably the three most common. Yes, there are others. There's hydrobromic acid and there's hydroiodic acid. And there are chloric acids and perchloric acids, which really only kind of come into play if, you know, you do things like um, maintain a large pool or um, those kinds of things. So uh, we, we, we don't see those other ones nearly as often as these three. Now on the weak acid side, the weak acid side, um, probably the most common weak acid is acetic acid. Um, acetic acid um, is the common active ingredient in vinegar. Vinegar is roughly a 5% solution of acetic acid mixed with water. The different types of vinegar that exist largely come from where the, where the acetic acid was generated from. So apple cider vinegar, well, you guessed it, it's from the fermentation of apples. So um, part of the process that is used to make, you know, beers and wines, the fermentation process, if you let that process go for too long, the alcohols that are generated turn into vinegars through an oxidation process. And that is where a lot of vinegars can come from. Now, there are other easier ways to get those. But if, if you're looking at the types of vinegars that you buy at the grocery store, the ones that have the fancy names usually are derived from some different kinds of food sources. Your distilled white vinegar usually is not. But like I said, 
Malt vinegar, well, that comes from malts. Um, red wine vinegar, well, you guessed it, it comes from um, soured red wine. Apple cider vinegar comes from soured apple cider. Um, which is one of the reasons why if you let that apple cider that you buy at the fall harvest just sit in your fridge just a little bit too long, it goes from having that pleasant apple cider bite to kind of this really bitter, acerbic kind of taste to it. Well, that's, guess what? The bacteria kept doing their job and they converted all the sugars into alcohols and vinegars and you're tasting the combination of the both. And that's why it doesn't taste good anymore. No. No. Vinegar is a result of the conversion process from alcohol through an excessive uh, oxidation. So if alcohol is left to sit out in the air long enough under the right conditions, it will eventually all turn into vinegar. Now, if you're doing this in your backyard, you might end up getting a combination of the two, but if you're buying it commercially, they distill out the, the vinegar from the alcohol before they would ever bottle it and sell it. Some more about acids. They are considered strong electrolytes, meaning that when we put them into water, they will actually conduct electricity and they will do so quite well. Electrolyte character is given by the ability to generate ions in solution. So the stronger the acid is, the more ions it puts into the water, the better it is at conducting electricity. As I mentioned before, there are, there are several common strong acids, seven in particular. Three of them I've mentioned, the fourth one I mentioned in passing, the perchloric acid. Um, that's this last one here. And the reason I neglected to say too much about it before is because of these four it is the one you are the least likely to run into unless you hold a very, very specific kind of job. Um, Chances are in your everyday life, in your industrial work life, you're not going to encounter them unless you're doing maintenance or, you know, disinfecting, cleaning of really large scale kinds of um, water or pools or, or those kinds of things. That's really where you see the, the, the perchloric acid being used the most. By contrast, weak acids generally do not ionize completely in water. So with a strong acid, we saw hydrochloric acid. Every single HCl turned into H pluses and Cl minuses. We had a 100% conversion there. With weak acids, we don't get that kind of conversion. What we get instead is usually a very modest conversion somewhere anywhere between and again depends on concentration it depends on a number of things but generally speaking anywhere between two and ten percent of the molecules actually break apart now it all dissolves it all dissolves but not all of it breaks apart and so as a result we do have ions present in the solution, so that solution will conduct electricity, but it does so on a very weak kind of basis. It's a very weak conductivity.
So we've got our strong acids, we've got our weak acids. The strong acids tend to be a lot more powerful. They tend to be a lot more reactive. They tend to ionize better, have greater electrolytic properties. The weak acids are basically just lesser versions of all of those properties. There's another way to classify, not just strong and weak, but these are terms that you do still see from time to time. Mineral acids, sometimes known as binary acids, these are acids that have two elements in them, hydrogen and some other non-metal. They do not have oxygen in them. So this is your hydrochloric acid. This is your hydrobromic acid. This is your hydrofluoric acid. This is your hydrosulfuric acid, H2S. Um, the, the stuff that smells like rotten eggs. Um, all of these acids can exist in two forms. They have a gas phase form. The gas phase form is not acidic, but has some pretty nasty properties to it. So hydrogen chloride actually exists as a gas. Um, and if you happen to smell hydrogen chloride gas, you will notice an immediate burning effect in your nostrils. Why? Oh, well, because your nostrils are filled with moisture. And so what happens is as soon as it encounters your nostrils, it touches water and goes from hydrogen chloride gas to hydrochloric acid, which starts to burn the snot out of your nose, literally. So again, the difference between these two terms, the G and the AQ is all about state. In the gas phase, It's not acidic. It's reactive, but it's not acidic. AQ stands in for aqueous, means that it is dissolved in water. Being dissolved in water, it takes on its acidic properties. So that's one defining feature of binary acids that does separate those binary acids from the other acids. The non-binary acids, known as the oxy acids, these are the ones that we talked about in the previous slide. These are the ones where we start with those non-metallic oxides, P2O5, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, a lot of those polluting gases. And when they encounter with water in the upper atmosphere or they encounter water in the laboratory, they turn into acids. Sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, phosphoric acid, nitric acid, none of these acids exist outside of the aqueous phase. None of them have gas-like forms that exist outside of you know the, the 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 gas that they were all generated from in that excuse me in that combustion so the big walk away here these do not exist outside of water You're not going to find gaseous sulfuric acid. You're not going to find gaseous perchloric acid. What will happen is if you start to boil these acids, they will end up starting to dissociate from each other, start to break apart. Sulfuric acid will break apart into sulfur dioxide and water vapor. Sulfur dioxide is nasty stuff on its own but it is not necessarily acidic. Um, 
So that's one defining distinguishing feature between them. Yes, so through chemical action, yes, we can, we can neutralize these acids. We can do something called flocculation, where we basically cause them to react with other materials and form solids, and then the solids settle out and the purified water pushes through. So, no, the, these, um, even though acid rain's a real deal, um, these are the kinds of things that this is why you have municipal water plants. This is why you have wastewater treatment plants in every major town and every major city because, well, they're necessary. Now, if your water comes from a well source um, and you don't have that middleman in between, there's usually steps that you have to do to purify the water. Otherwise, you're dealing usually with a whole bunch of sulfur and iron and other things in it anyway. Um, that's that's a that's another conversation for another day all right the last type of acid is called the organic acid organic acids are also referred to as carboxylic acids these are acids that contain carbons hydrogens and oxygens now remember in that original slide i said that there were no c OH acids. There were no such thing. And this is still true because this group here, the carboxylate group, this is actually a COOH group. That little bit of extra oxygen in there makes all of the difference. This is what is going to set it apart from being an alcohol versus being an acid, is that extra oxygen. In particular, that's terrible drawing. In particular, this carbon to oxygen group right here. The presence of that plus that OH makes this hydrogen ion right here very easy to pop off. And that's what gives these acids their acidic character. So this is where we will stop for today. On Wednesday, we will keep working through and looking at some common uses for acids, some general properties. And then eventually, we'll pivot over to talking about bases. Um, that's for Wednesday. Um, any questions for right now? All right. Have a good day. I'll see you Wednesday morning.